Welcome to Amit and the Child Survivors of the Holocaust, Los Angeles presentation of In Their Own Words, How We Survived by Child Survivors. This special event commemorates Yom HaShoah, and I thank you for joining us. My name is Robbie Perlstein. I am the Amit Mid-Atlantic and New England Regional Director. I'd like to extend my gratitude to Hillary Brody, a meat regional director in Los Angeles, and to Marsha Giuseppe, a devoted a meat supporter who will share an Amit update with you and then introduce her colleagues. Hillary will lead a Q&A after the presentations, so we invite you to please enter your comments and questions in the chat room during the presentation. Marsha Raines Giuseppe is a woman of diverse and eclectic interests. Trained as an archaeologist unearthing the stories and people of the past, she now focuses on the stories and people of her own times, particularly the survivors. She has long had a focus on Jewish art, taught history of Jewish art from ancient times until our own, worked with con contemporary Judaical artists, and co-founded the internationally acclaimed Los Angeles Festival of Jewish Art. Among her museum exhibits were Magic and Superstition in the Jewish Tradition, My Brother's Keeper, and Memory and Meaning, the Holocaust Through the Eyes of the Artist. Happy to present Marsha. Yom HaShoah will take place this year on April 8th. In Israel, the sirens blast throughout the land and traffic and people stop for a moment of commemoration. Today, I welcome all of you to a different, but I hope meaningful commemoration on behalf of the Child Holocaust Survivors Los Angeles and Amit. As you know, Yom HaShoah is a day to honor the memory of those murdered during the Holocaust, many of whose names, date, and place of death are not even known. Some of you may wonder how this shidduch happened between child survivors in California and Amit, a national organization with a strong focus on children and innovative educational excellence in schools and institutions throughout Israel. We discovered a strong connection to child survivors from Amit's very founding by Bessie Gottesfeld in 1925. Her trip to Israel in 1930 to help found a girls' vocational school grew into a mission to help children fleeing from Nazi Europe and the Holocaust. Many were alone, often traumatized, not knowing what happened to their families. And Amit, then known as Mizrahi Women, was there to love, care for, nurture, and educate these first child survivors. Child survivors are not to be confused with the second generation. The name child survivors tells us exactly who they are. That is, people who had been children during the Holocaust. Many, if not most, had never spoken about their experiences. When I became director curator of what was then called the Martyrs Memorial and Museum of the Holocaust, we began to ask child survivors to heal their silence and speak to teachers, students, and other museum visitors. Some of the older survivor speakers said to me, why are you asking them? They have no stories, no memory. They were too young. But think back, dear audience, as you listen today, what you can remember from when you were three or five or six. Many of us do have at least some memories. And the speakers today and the other 49 authors who were only children had memories. They do remember and they can tell stories even if just in fragments. True, memory can be elusive. Sometimes that memory, especially for the very youngest, even those who were babies born after the war began have memories. Some more sensory than intellectual, a sound, a smell, a taste, but the memory existed as did the effects of trauma. It was there deep down inside them, repressed, but waiting. It was a need waiting to be allowed to be expressed. 
Help came in 1983 when Dr. Flora Bell Kinsler, Zichrono Lavracha, and Dr. Sarah Moskowitz saw that need. Under their guidance, the Child Survivors of the Holocaust Los Angeles was formed. It became a haven for dialogue and support. It became a family for many who had no other family. Members celebrate holidays and special events, happy and sad together, as families do. The book, how We Survived, 52 Personal Stories by Child Survivors of the Holocaust, grew out of the nurturing environment of the group. Each story is written in the author's own voice and is unique in time, place, and gender. Each of the 52 stories provides us with insight into a child's experiences with hate, prejudice, pure evil, personal fortitude, and resistance. They are stories about individuals who help them, and most of all, about courage. The courage of these three speakers and the other 49 authors. They are the last, the final eyewitnesses. Today and always, we honor them and their memories. Those of us who hear and read the stories now become the witnesses, keeper of the legacy. The lessons they teach us are still relevant today, unfortunately, as we continue to learn about the rise of anti-Semitism and hate crimes against the other. The other, that is someone, something perceived different from us. As Jews, we know well about the experiences of being the other. So let us now listen to Dana, Anne, and Henry three individuals who survived experiences in three different countries without a normal childhood, but who are determined to face the painful task of remembering in order to help others understand how the cruel rampant hatred that destroyed their families and shattered their childhood must not be permitted to flourish again. Dana Shapiro Schwartz was born in Lwów, Poland in 1935. When the war began, she was four years old. She and her mother survived ghetto and hiding. Anne Bondi Signet was born in Rome, Italy in 1928. In 1943, she and her family went into hiding in the mountain village of Alvido. Her entire family survived. Henry Slucky was born in Paris, France in 1934 and is living proof that the U.S. did bring at least some children to safety in America. He will provide insights into our own day through his story. Our final speakers, representing the third generation, our future, are two incredible college students, Trevor and Matthew Goodman, whose mother, Dina, is the daughter of Marie Kaufman, former president of the group, and managing editor of the book. And we'll leave time for Q&A afterwards. Um, and I give you Dana Schwartz. So one day they came to our house, very distinguished, important looking. They look around and they like our home very much. They nod and smile, and I feel very flattered and proud. I am four or five. You can each take one valise and leave the rest, they say. Be out in a half an hour, they say. I'm incredulous. They can't do that. It's our house, I cry indignantly when they leave. But they can and they do. Mother is strangely resigned. We leave my toys and my dolls and some part of my childhood and safety never to be there again. Dad takes us to another part of town. It's called the ghetto and it's ugly and scary and strange. We get two rooms in a kitchen. I spend much time at the stove. There's nothing to cook but water. It's warmer there. We now live in the same small space with my grandmother, my uncle, Moshe, and the senator's wife. She's my dad's best friend's mother. He and his brother have escaped to Portugal. 
her husband had died and dad is looking after her. The senator's wife puts on airs. My mother smiles at her, the habit of looking of boiling water and pretending it's tea. And she calls, tea is on when it's boiled. It's not tea at all, but it's water. We respond gravely and pretend we sit and drink with style and grace. Her world is intact again. Dad winks at me behind her back and I delight in the job, in the joke. My uncle, the chemistry and physics teacher, is a bachelor. He's not teaching now, of course, but he teaches me how to read and write a bit. We're very hungry. Time passes. Water boils. I stare at the gas flame and I look at the sky when we're out of the hole. There are three spots on the building I live in. People are very uncomfortable about those spots. The Germans play a cruel game. They grab Jewish toddlers by their ankles and they splatter their brains on the first swing, like baseball. My mother holds me close. I am quiet. The world is hard to understand. One day, my dad comes home and pulls out a bread from beneath his overcoat. It's big and round, and I'm very hungry. He cuts it ceremoniously, and I am anxious for each crumb. It has a pungent smell, and it's gritty. Lots of sand or earth or dirt mixed in, but it's delicious. I know my daddy can do anything. Dad heard that the action is coming. It's a roundup of Jews. They herd the Jews like cattle. No one knows where. No one ever returns. With every meeting of friends, there are many names whispered, the Friedmans, the Goldsteins, and so on. It means that they have disappeared. But now the action is coming. Where do we hide? Can we outsmart them? Can we survive it? They seem to come one at a time like a storm. Dad finds a place. It's under the apartment house. There's a space under the foundation. We reach it by crawling behind and under the three stairs of the whole courtyard. There are still some non-Jews living in the building. There's no hurry for them to move out. Only when they find an apartment formerly occupied by Jews that is to their liking, did they go. They would be delighted to see where the Jews are hiding. If they inform the Germans, they may get special consideration or even a better apartment, who knows? So we must crawl into our new space under the building at night when no one is looking. They would be delighted to see where they where we are, but they can't see us now. The problem is that my grandma and the senator's wife are just too old to crawl down there. And there's not even enough room, headroom to sit up. My father takes my my father talks to some neighbors. And people will be put in a room. And a big cupboard will be pushed in front of the door to mask the entrance. It's done and we hope for the best. Yet they find them. We crawl under the house. We are squashed like sardines. There's a woman next to me. She has a baby at her breast and the baby seems too weak to suck much. Two toddlers who stare at her wordlessly, an older boy whom I call David, although, David, although I never know his name. The children never make a sound. We all lay there afraid that we will get discovered, listening for the sound of boots and terrified when we hear them yelling, Jungraus! They do not discover us on their repeated searches. Several days pass 
We pass the bottle for urine around. People politely turn their heads. We have bottles which we replenish with water on our nightly stretch trips to the courtyard at three in the morning. We stand there and stretch and I look up into the beautiful night sky, more vivid than I have ever seen it before. I speak to God a lot, but he seems too far away. The lady I was lying next to gets more and more perturbed. She has no food for her children and they're fading. Her son David starts to ask his mother to let him go and search for some food. She will not hear of it. We ourselves have only a few sugar cubes for the three of us. They have nothing more. He keeps insisting. His mother has a very worried look. He tells her that he'll be quick to believe him that he will be good and fast. He talks about the feeling of responsibility since his father had been taken away. He must be about 11 or 12, maybe 13. She looks at the toddlers and then at him and back again, finally, she nods. A real selfish choice. David kisses the children. And his mother kisses his mother and sneaks out to find food. Morning comes. I lie next to her and I look into her eyes and they're filled with horror. They change as time passes. More time passes. The boy does not come back. He never comes back. I see it in the mother's eyes. My father, father is fed up with the actions in the ghetto, he says, and with people disappearing. I know what he means because I miss my grandma and my uncle and everybody. And, and also people I knew well before and so many others. I hear the conversations about who is missing now. Cole, my father's friend, the one I don't like because I think he has a crush on my mother. <laughs> well, who uh, apparently knows how to get fake papers. He asks, my mother keeps begging him to get, get us out somehow. And, and Cole is the one that helps us buy Christian papers. It's an enormous undertaking, and with great luck, we are able to arrange it. And we escape. Of course, my father can't go with us because he's circumcised. My dad explains that I have to change my name and ask me what I might want it to be. He lets me keep my first name since it's not Jewish at all, but the name of a Polish queen of old. I'm named after my parent, uh, grandfather, David. So my first name, Danusha, is just fine. They add to it Marisha, which is Maria, which is a very good Christian name. And now the last name has to be considered. I mean, Shapira would never do. So they sit there and sit there and contemplate what will the last name be? Finally, one of my parents says, Pig. We'll put the name Pig in the name, and then the farmers will never guess that we're Jewish because all the farmers knew that, that we the Jews were kosher and Pig was the main thing. And, and 
they would believe that anybody with a name like that could possibly be Jewish. So our Christian name becomes how to, to tell you in English something like Baikonovsky. Baikonovsky. And we laugh. It's the best, the only, the one of two actual times when I laughed in the ghetto. And so I became Danusha Bekonovsky. And we were able to escape the ghetto. And we came to say goodbye to dad. It was very cloak and dagger, you know, how we escaped and what was at night and I was covered and all kinds of stories. And I stood there to say goodbye to my dad, pretending that he was not my dad at all, but some Jew with a star, whereas we had taken off our star. My mother says, pretend you don't know him. Don't look at him, don't smile at him, don't hug him, don't say anything because the guard is looking at us and it's fine for us to be trading things. He'll bring us something, we'll give him something pretending that we are the uh, handling, you know, but you must not make any eye contact with him. And I remember that I had to keep my arms down towards my knees and I was not to look at him and I knew in my heart of hearts that I may never ever see him again and I remember Thank you. I was born in Anna Bundi in Rome, Italy on September 5th, 1928. My father was a successful businessman. I had two brothers and a sister. Uh, my oldest brother, Amideo, was uh, a resident physician in a hospital in Rome. And my other brother, Enzo, was working with my dad. My sister, Clara, was a school teacher. And that's me. This picture was taken when I was three years old. These are two cousins of ours. Um, that picture was taken at Anzio, uh, where we had a, a beach house. Jewish people in Italy before the Holocaust had a very peaceful life. Um, Mussolini was a dictator, but a benevolent dictator. And Jewish people held high positions, uh, high level positions uh, in commerce, in the professions, uh, in, in, in banking, and in, even in government and the military. And um, it was very peaceful and a happy life. I had a very happy childhood. Um, in 1938, they passed the racial laws, totally opposite to the life that we had been used to. Jewish people in high positions were demoted and even fired. Jewish students could no longer go to public school. I was going to a Jewish day school, so it didn't affect me, but it certainly uh, did others. Hitler had asked Mussolini several times to give him his Jews, Italian Jews. 
At first, Mussolini had refused, saying that Italian Jews were just as Italian as Italian non-Jews. But then in 1939, the war broke out and Hitler invaded Czechoslovakia and Poland and conquered them, went back to Mussolini and said, um, you know, I'm going to conquer all of Europe. And um, I'll give you peace if you give me your Jews. Well, this offer was too alluring to ignore. Mussolini had always had delusions of grandeur, always wanted an empire. And this was going to be his empire. And uh, so uh, uh, he, he relented. In 1943, the Allies made a landing in Southern Italy at Salerno, which is near Naples. They were racing towards Rome. And, and um, my dad estimated that uh, it would probably take him two weeks to get to Rome. My brother, not the doctor, the other one, Enzo, he went south, crossed the front lines, and joined the Allies. And it, it was not easy because he was being shot at from both sides, but he made it. By this time, Italians had just about had enough of Mussolini and deposed him. And later, they even lynched him. With Mussolini gone, my dad figured the Nazis would soon be taken over. So on October 15th, 1943, he had my mom pack uh, for the three of us enough for two weeks. Why two weeks? Because he figured that's when the allies would be in Rome. And, and um, uh, it was just the three of us because Amedeo was at the hospital, Enzo had gone south. My sister was married to a captain in the Italian army whose family had olive orchards in the mountains. And that's where they were. And as a matter of fact, it was my brother-in-law who was instrumental in, in the, um, getting a Christian family in a nearby village to agree to hide the three of us. And, and um, that's, that's where we went. When we left Rome, we went there. Uh, so my father had been <clears throat> right. On October 16th, the very next day, Nazis were in Rome rounding up Jews. Two of them, we learned later, sat on our in front of our house in shift, taking turns day and night, waiting for us to come home. Well, we, uh, they waited a long time because we weren't coming home. Amadeo couldn't go home because of them. So he took the night shift at the hospital so he'd have a roof over his head during curfew until the administrator told him that he had to leave because every day Nazis were coming looking for doctors with Jewish last name. And we had a very Jewish last name. So what, did, what could he do? He hopped the freight train, there were no passenger trains running, hopped the freight train, and then even by ox cart, he made it to the village where we were and he joined us there. And, <clears throat> but, um, Nearby, there was a mountain called Monte Cassino near, the, near our village. And on top of Monte Cassino was a monastery where the Germans had stockpiled arms and ammunition, which caused the Allies to come to a dead stop. They were stopped dead in their track. So our two weeks turned into 10 months. It was a long time. And at, at, the end of the two, at, the, at the end of the 10 months, the Allies did break through, finally. 
I had made friends with some of the village girls there. And one day, one of these girls came to me and said, my brother was there. Well, at first I thought she meant Amadeo because he'd been there for some time, but no, she meant Enzo. And we hugged and we hugged. And when we finished hugging, we talked about how to break the news to my mom. She was crying herself to sleep every single night I could hear her. She didn't know whether her son was gonna be, was dead or alive, if he would ever come back, if she'd ever see him again. So we were afraid that this would give her a heart attack and that the news had to be broken to her very gently. So I did. It took me a long time, but eventually I convinced her that the possibility existed that Enzo had come home and went, came looking for us and that he might even be right here. Well, as you know, I opened the door and let him in and you, you can just imagine the scene. After some time, my, both of my brothers returned to Rome and got things ready for our return, which we did. In August of 1944, we went back to Rome and um, uh, our lives resumed. My dad started his business again. My brother Amadeo start, restarted his medical practice. Enzo worked for dad. And Clara resumed school teaching. And I, uh, my education had been interrupted by the Holocaust. So I completed my education by private tutor, which fortunately my father could afford. Um, after a bit, I went to work for the um, American Provost Marshal who had Provost Marshal is the head of the military police. I went to work for him as a translator. And this is how I met the Provost Sergeant. His name was Robert Signet. We were married 18 months later. And 11 days after that, we were married on a, on a fateful date. October 15, 1947. 11 days later, we sailed for America. Well, I must tell you the culture shock was there, but thankfully it was diminished by the fact that I spoke English fluently. Um, we had a boy and a girl, both born in a small town that from the big city of Rome, I went to a small town in Northern California and both my kids were born there. But, um, but on a vacation, we came to the San Fernando Valley and I told my husband, go find a job because this is where I want to live and die. And this is what happened. Um, you, uh, you may wonder how the Holocaust affected me. My joyous childhood, surrounded by happy, loving people, was not reality. I was shielded by much of the ugliness by my parents. And, and until, until the Holocaust. I, um, I learned that um, there are some decent people like the ones who had sheltered us, but um, that there also there is also a great deal deal of evil, um, evil that pervades the whole world. Anti-Semitism has never really been abated. On the contrary, it's on the rise. And the Holocaust intensified the, the hatred 
that those who, who, who nurtured the dead and reawakened where it was dormant. When upon our return to Rome, I learned that many of our relatives had been taken to concentration camps and murdered, I was assailed by a feeling of guilt because I survived when so many of them had died. Why them and not me? People told me I shouldn't feel guilty, that God had a purpose in mind when he spared me. And that purpose revealed itself when I became the legal guardian of my two great grandsons. These are my two great grandsons. And this picture was taken when my niece and her husband from Rome came to visit. And um, this is my niece, her husband took the picture. And there's um, the rest of my family, my husband, my son, and his wife. And I raised those two boys um, in my 70s, mind you. But I gave them what they could not have had with their mother, who divorced their father, who was my grandson. I gave them good nourishing food instead of junk food that they were eating. I gave them a good education, both regular and Jewish. They were both bar mitzvah and um, they went to new community Jewish high school. And today they both own their own businesses. And the younger one uh, told me last week that uh, he and his wife are opening a new store, another store, because he already has one. People pat me on the back to tell me that I did such a good job. Well, maybe I did. I'm certainly very proud of them. Um, my family and I were among the luckiest survivors. And we were among the luck, luckiest survivors of the most infamous, infamous period in Jewish and world history. Others who survived had spent months and years in the hands of monsters who epitomized man's inhumanity to man. Six million Jews died in their hands. And so we say, never again. Thank you for listening. Thank you, and Henry. Oops. <laughs> How do we, whoops. Oops. Just one second while Henry gets his slides up here. Yeah. I dedicate my presentation to all the innocent millions who perished during the Holocaust, victims of fascism, and to our courageous rescuers, known and unknown, who saved us from sure death. My name is Henry Slucky. I'm a Holocaust survivor, a husband, a father, a grandfather, a retired professor from the University of Southern California School of Medicine. We must tell our stories, our Holocaust stories, and help eradicate the Holocaust deniers' pernicious myths. I was born in Paris, France, July 12th, 1934. Here I am at the age of seven months, my only baby picture. Street that I lived on with my parents before the war. 
As a premature anti-fascist, my father volunteered in, the, in 1939 in the French Foreign Legion to fight against the invading German army. And we take a last minute picture. I was very sad that he was leaving us, but I was reassured that it would be only for a very short time. This, I think, set the tone for my life, the optimism of my parents in reassuring me. France was divided into occupied and unoccupied areas, and my father was demobilized from the unoccupied uh, zone in southern France, and my mother and I escaped Paris by train to join him in Montauban on uh, June 28th, 1943, and there it is in southwestern France, not far from the Spanish border. Beautiful town with a river running through it. This uh, is the house where we that we rented, the one with the uh, white uh, uh, door. Oops. <laughs> Ah, here we go. Uh, for the next two years, we live a normal family life until August 26, 1942, six o'clock in the morning, there's a knock on our door. My parents knew who it was. It was the gendarme, the French police. They ran, my, my parents ran into my bedroom and uh, very quietly awakened me and said, we're pretending that no one is home. So we're gonna play a game. It's the let's pretend nobody's home game. And the gendarme knocks for an hour and a half while we sat in darkness waiting for them to leave. Finally, they left. And then we are hidden by our landlords, the Kazan family on their farm in the outskirts of town. They help us get the needed legal documents and life goes back to normal until we sell all of our possessions and hire three Spanish guides and escape from France into Spain on November 25th, 1942, exactly two weeks to the day after the Germans occupied all of France. We crossed the Pyrenees on foot during the night to avoid the border guard. And so we are illegal aliens, not my terms, hence quotation marks. Barcelona becomes our new home. Uh, and uh, at the same time, Eleanor Roosevelt is proposing to the United States Congress that they issue visas for Jewish refugee children to re-enter or to enter the US without their parents, uh, similar to or modeled on the kinder transport program that sent uh, thousands of children from Austria and uh, Germany uh, to uh, England. The American Joint Distribution Committee and the Hebrew Immigration Aid Society administered the program and 125 of us come to the US between May and October of 1943 in three separate groups. I was on the first, uh, there's my hero, I was on the very first uh, convoy list and my parents couldn't send me away. They took my name off at the last minute. Then I was put on the second convoy list. And again, my name was taken off. And finally, when the third one was announced, it was also to, uh, announced that this was the very last one that would be going to America. So we, uh, said goodbye to our parents. Uh, we children, there were 10 of us, strangers to one another for aged from three to 15 uh, in the compartment. Uh, parents are out on the platform. Everyone is crying and the train pulls out. Ah, we uh, arrive in Lisbon, Portugal on September 22nd 1943, and I'm the boy right here in the center uh, with the short pants, uh, a suit that my parents, needleworkers, uh, had uh, made for me. 
Uh, we sailed to America on the Serpa Pinto, a Portuguese ship, cross the Atlantic, arrive in Philadelphia on October 13th, 1943. I go to live with my great uncle and my great aunt, Nathan and Jenny Gura in Washington Heights. So in summary, my Holocaust life is that my father goes off to the army and he survives. The gendarmes come to deport us and we escape. The Nazis occupy all of France and we escape. I'm separated from my parents and we are reunited in 1946. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, we are reunited in New York City. And in 1949, we moved to Los Angeles. So we are 49ers. Uh, in 1959, I married Carol Ostroff. Here I am with Carol and my parents. Uh, we have two children, Michelle Debra and Daniel Mark, two granddaughters, Jenna Brielle and Lauren Brooke. And in 2013, uh, Carol and I take our children and grandchildren on a pilgrimage tour. Here we are in front of our apartment in Paris, where I lived uh, until the war. And here we are in southern France, right across the street from the house with a white door. And I'm saying to my kids if and grandkids, if that door if that door had been opened in the early morning of August 25th, 1942, none of us would probably be here. So my slogan is never again to anyone, anywhere. In America, 2017, Muslim, they came for the Muslims. And this couple is holding up a sign that says they spoke up and will continue to speak up because they are Jews who remember. There are Holocaust survivors because there were Holocaust rescuers. They are the true heroes of this story. Trauma is minimized by careful planning and caring. And Holocaust survivors became part of America's human rights movement. We were on the streets demonstrating civil rights and women's rights, right? all human rights right from the beginning. America has benefited from refugees. Refugees must be seen as a benefit to America and refugees must be part of America. In conclusion, and with deep gratitude, I repeat that it is thanks to the rescuers who risk their own security and their lives by refusing to be perpetrators, collaborators, or just idle bystanders that I, a Holocaust survivor, am here to today to tell my story. We did so in our book, and Pastor Niemöller reminded us that first they came for the communists, then they came for the Jews, and they came for the trade unionists, and they came for the Catholics, and no one spoke up. And when they came, when it was time, and they came for him, by that time, no one was left to speak up. I end my presentation with Pete Seeger singing his song, Quite Early Morning. The dawn. This thought keeps me moving on. Let me let me get that right from the beginning again. No, it's darkest before the dawn. 
this thought keeps me moving on if we could heed these early warnings the time is now quite early morning if we could Thank you. Thank you, honey. Trevor and Matthew, the next generation. Hello, everyone. My name is Matthew Goodman, and I am a part of the next generation, a generation of passing on family history through stories and speaking truth. Whether those truths are good or bad, they should be told and given the light that they deserve. Some stories may be more visceral and harder to hear than others, but their differences do not mean that they shouldn't be told. One thing that our grandma, my Bobby, Marie has made sure to teach us is that no sh two stories are the same, but that does not mean that one is better than the other. No matter the story or storyteller, all history needs to be told and heard. Being a part of the future generations, it is our duty to carry on telling these stories with the same level of importance as they were told in the past by those who witnessed them. This is our duty because without retelling them, they will be forgotten. When history is forgotten, intolerance and destruction tends to repeat itself, and this is something the world cannot afford to do. It is our duty to continue the fight against inequalities and injustices. Marie Kaufman is a fighter. She wakes up every day and fights for her life as she continues to deal with illnesses. As her grandchildren, we have witnessed firsthand how incredibly strong of a woman she truly is. This strength has inspired many people that she is unaware of. Most importantly, she has inspired us, her grandchildren. She inspires us to fight for not just our health, but for others' health as well, both physical and mental. A fight for others is a fight for justice. When one community or person struggles, we need to stand up and help. This is how Marij survived and how I am here to share this with future generations because of a community of people who helped her keep her alive in France. Hi everybody, my name is Trevor Goodman and I had the honor of growing up two blocks away from my beautiful grandmother. Um, I'm super fortunate to have grown up with a survivor. My Bubby's story is another unique story that everybody needs to hear. While it sure is unique, across the board, there's a common theme we hear amongst many survivor stories. That common theme is a selfless act and a sacrifice. An open-handed Christian family took my Bubby in, hid her, and kept her safe during the Holocaust. Because of this family's self, selfless act of kindness, I am here today. English writer Aldous Huxley once said that men do not learn very much from the lessons of history is the most important lessons of all history. There's great importance in passing along stories, attending events like these and reflecting on the past. We can use history in our favor to help us navigate the present time and learn from history's calamities. If history teaches us anything, it helps us make well-reasoned decisions when it comes to voting for our future. History teaches us how to resist. This time period right now is so important because we still have some living survivors like we've seen tonight to tell these stories. But that time is finite and we must ask our questions now and write down these stories. Once all the survivors are no longer here to tell their stories, it's our job to keep, them, keep these memories alive. As a representative of the next generation, I promise to keep these memories alive and continue the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all to, for your shares. They're really so beautiful and meaningful. And it's such an honor for us to be able to do this program with you, 
and to share with our community these really important stories. As we work with children, that we can be continuing to, to bring this wisdom and this important history forward. It's a blessing for us, and thank you. I want to invite everybody now, anybody that has a question for the Q&A, we would really love to ask. Um, so as they come in, we can start with, um, Henry, somebody is asking you, how did your parents, how were your parents able to reach Cuba? Hold on, let me unmute you here. That was a story unto itself. Uh, my aunt and uncle in uh, 1936 left France and emigrated to Mexico. When they got there, they arranged for uh, visas for my parents and me. Uh, when um, my parents in, 19, in April of 1944, after I had left uh, Barcelona, um, wanted to um, or, or applied for uh, exit visas from Spain, uh, Franco uh, turned them down uh, because in 1936 at the Spanish Civil War, uh, only two countries in the world uh, were sided with uh, the democratically elected government of Spain. One was the Soviet Union and the other was Mexico. All the other countries basically took a hands-off policy. So <clears throat> the first thing that Franco did, one of the first things he did in taking power was to break off relations with those two countries. So when my parents asked to go to uh, Mexico, um, they were turned down because that country just didn't exist as far as Franco was concerned. In steps the Hayas and the Joint Distribution Committee with a strategy of triangulation. That is, they say, okay, um, we will ask Cuba for a transit visa for you to go there and out, in and out, which was okay with Cuba. Uh, Spain was okay with giving my parents an exit visa to go to Cuba. And Mexico, we already, they already had their visas. And that's the way they got out of Spain. They took a ship in late April of 44 to uh, go to uh, the Western Hemisphere, uh, hoping to go to Mexico. When they got to Cuba, they discovered that the visas from 1936 had expired. And so they were stuck in Havana, but at least it was on this side of the ocean. And uh, that's why uh, at that point they got stranded there. And um, 1946 is when we finally got them up into the United States. Thank you for your question. Thank you, thank you, Henry. Um, after the program, after tomorrow, everyone should know we're going to be sending out a recording of this. Please feel encouraged to share it with, with anybody that, that you think will, will listen. We really want to be spreading this information. Um, I'm going to share a final song here and let's get this up. Never say that you have reached the very end When then skies a bitter future may portend For sure the hour for which we end will yet arrive And our marching steps will thunder we survive for sure the hour for which we end will yet arrive, and our marching steps will thunder we survive. Not made but blood in 
transcribe this bitter song we sing. Tis not a caroling of birds upon the wing, but twas a people midst the crashing fires of hell that sang this song and fought courageous till it fell. But twas a people midst the crashing fires of hell that sang this song and fought courageous till it fell. They fled so big. They nimble and fly in a burst, tell and fly a tig. While come in bed, no huns or oys get bent to show. And sweat a poik tone, so drop me to sign in to. While come in bed, no huns or oys get bent to show. And sweat a poik tone, so drop me to sign in to. Imagine that they marched to their death singing this song. Thank you, everybody, for coming this evening. Thank you from Amit Children, and thank you to the Children of the Holocaust for partnering with us. Um, we'll be sending a follow-up email for how you can be in touch with Children of the Holocaust, to order a copy of the book, or be in touch with any of the authors. Please also visit meetchildren.org to get to know us a bit better. And we really look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. It's Marie. Okay. Mm. <laughs> Hi, Marie. Hi. Where'd she go? Oh, there she is. Hi. Hi, it's Roger me. and Monica. Oh, hi. Oh, hi, hi. Monica. Oh. Hey, Ken. Hi, oh, Ken. So glad to see your faces. Good to see you. Yeah. Oh, thank you for being there. Mary, yeah. you've been there. And my last name is Good. So <laughs> I'm all, maybe I'm related. <laughs> yeah. Good to see you. Thanks, Tom. Thank you for being there and for always being there in my life, actually. <laughs> We're brothers and sister in a way. Indeed. Yes, thank you both for being such good friends. Some, well. some of us call ourselves uh, phantom siblings. <laughs> <laughs> We're phantoms. <laughs> Phantom sibling. Yeah. If I may, I was told that the hostess asked me to unmute myself. I myself am a child of survivors living in a suburb of um, Philadelphia with uh, my own stories. My parents survived by hiding. I was born after the war in a DP camp. But most importantly, I, I did want to ask a question but since time is limited, I just want to say we're all concerned about the rise of anti-Semitism, but America is still America. I just came back from New York. Oh, my daughter lives with her, with her family on the Upper West Side, if anybody is familiar with that. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the prayers for Passover, this, their synagogue met on a hill in Central Park and the men were wearing uh, 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 talitim, talitot, and kippot, 
and nobody was afraid and he sang loudly and and nobody nobody was was disparaging and i just want to add a little bit of hope that uh, uh america is still uh america and that i hope we uh oh. maintain our jewish heritage as well as the sorrows that were embedded in our history thank you very very much thank you thank you for sharing and marie are you still there, there yes i am i am you we are this? survivors my twin sister and i from wow. shanghai oh, wow. here we are in shanghai china and you can't really see that i guess here. oh there we go yeah yeah with our friend sonia who was also born there as we were and 69 years later we met up we we found each wow. other on the internet and same and, picture and got together and we replicated the picture in german yeah. <laughs> this was a wonderful program yeah thank you thank you so much thank you thank you guys it was wonderful <laughs> thank you dina the stories and thank you dina my darling daughter who coordinates <laughs> these things and thank you marcia josephi for taking this project on so beautifully and look at what you brought tonight. <laughs> and it's Thank all you. your fault, right? But it's all my fault. It's and all your fault, right? But you like doing it. <laughs> <laughs> and I like you and you did a fantastic job. And, and I think job. you were you were among the first who spoke for me. Yes, so I thank you. But look what well, we've accomplished. I know it's it's just uh, to hear everybody and hear you know is it, so um, it's so precious and it become and you think it's precious at a certain time and then all of a sudden like tonight watching this I go you know you gasp for breath you know that it's is it really true all this happened you know and in our lives and now we can tell it and and um, and people are so generous with with doing that and. Uh, and the next generations. Well, you and, should be very you know. proud of your grandsons. They are right. incredible. Oh, yes. incredible. Oh. Thank you, Dina. Thank you, uh, Marie, really. You're so thank welcome. You. you know, thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Trevor. And I've got two grandchildren in New York um, who I know are watching this and I send my love to them. But because of the, you know, because of my rescuers, I have these children, these grandchildren, and so they are taking it on too. <laughs> They're, you know, it's a generation that you didn't think was going to keep going, uh, taking the story further. And look at what, look at what you've done. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank so, much. you. so great I, to see you, Marie. I was yes. just going to say to uh, thanks to Ken because he sat up till to way past midnight every night. Till we got that book together, <laughs> yeah, and, uh, and and make it real and make it accurate. So um, I hope I didn't forget anybody because I just everybody that worked on and John Gordon, yes, who's no longer with us. I do want to remember John, uh, who was president of our organization, who was more than president. I couldn't have done a thing without John. I took everything out with John first because I could trust what he would you know what he would do what he would how he would do it and he did so much for us he would have been thrilled to see this and i hope i hope his children and and um henny uh, henny, henny, watching henny, his, henny uh, was, was on the on the on the program i mean henny henny signed up she was here oh good okay i'm so yeah. glad i'm so glad because i thought of all these people yeah. Like all of a sudden, should have known. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm sure. glad Henny was there because um, I always feel John's presence in in this. So we just have to remember all these wonderful people. Magda's iPad. Hello. Hello. <laughs> so we thank yeah, thank the meet for for I putting. I feel so bad that I have to make you do. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't get that. Thank you, Marsha. Thank you so much. It's such an honor to work together with everybody, and and really, really, thank you for putting this together.
Thank you, Hillary. You, you really yes, yeah. pulled through. It's been a Thank pleasure you. to work with you, with all of you. And Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Henry and Dana. Thank you, Dana, Matthew Dana. and uh, Trevor. Are you still on? Thank you. If you're not. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was beautiful. Okay, everybody. Have a wonderful Bye. evening. Thank, Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Been a pleasure. Bye.